Hello, everybody. My name is John Pankowski, and welcome to a Florida Bar Approved Continuing Legal Education course entitled A Florida Lawyer's Guide to Advising the Trustee. For the next hour, we'll be speaking about a trustee's fiduciary duties regarding a Florida trust, as well as some beneficiary rights, so that you, a Florida lawyer, will be able to better advise the trustee. I am a trust and estate litigation attorney with the law firm of Penkowski Hauser in downtown West Palm Beach, Florida, located at 415 South Olive Avenue, a few blocks from the state courthouse, the probate court, as well as the federal courthouse, and one block west of the Intracoastal. Our firm limits its practice to litigation disputes and appeals involving wills, trusts, estates, guardianships, and related homestead and real estate and business interests. The gist of our CLE today is to assist the probate lawyer or the estate planning lawyer, the, the lawyer who drafts documents for clients, who prepares estate plans, and even elder law attorneys who's preparing estate plans for an elder law practice. And I'm going to be giving you some perspective and some thoughts from the trenches of the trial court, from a probate litigator's perspective. Uh, I invite you to listen to or attend free of charge other CLEs that are sponsored by our law firm, Penkowski Hauser. We have a number of Florida Bar approved CLE credits that are available through webinars. So on your screen now, you should see a PowerPoint presentation whose slides will be changing. And you'll be able to see the visual and you're hearing me as we go along through this webinar. In December of 2016, we offered three and a half hours of ethics credits for Florida attorneys. We offered CLEs uh, from uh, the end of 2016 through the first quarter of 2017 on such issues as estate planning malpractice, legal malpractice, charging liens, guardianship, and other matters. So if you need CLEs, if you're a Florida Bar attorney and you need CLEs, feel free to email amanda at phflorida.com and she'll provide you with some links so that you can attend those webinars. You'll get a course number and you'll get the number of credit hours that have been approved by the Florida Bar. At the end of today's hour, you will receive one general credit approved by the Florida Bar. We have the case number or the course number available at the end. Um, okay, so with that said, um, let me also tell you that if you would like a copy of my book, Pankowski's Trustee's Guide, 10 Steps to Family Trustee Excellence, you likewise can contact Amanda at the Pankowski Hauser Law Firm. Amanda at phflorida.com, P like Pankowski, H like Hauser, Florida, the state spelled out, dot com. Or you can call her. Her extension is 101. The area code is 561. And Amanda's number at the firm is 514-0900. Would be happy to send you a free copy of my book, Pankowski's Trustee's Guide. In that, you will no doubt recognize some common recurring problems that some trustees have in administering trusts and particularly with, with Florida law. So today, we have a number of uh, topics for discussion. We're going to start with the introduction, a kind of why are we here approach or look. We're going to talk about some of the worst aspects about trust, some of the best aspects about trust, why trust litigation is on the rise. We'll get right into the duties of Florida trustees and spend a lot of time on that. And the reason we'll spend a lot of time on that is because when we look at mistakes that individual trustees are making repeatedly over years and years and years, we always look at ourselves, the lawyers in our, our law firm and, and our support staff and paralegals, and we say, who is the best person or who is in the best position to advise this individual trustee of their duties? And typically, it, it often rests with the estate planning attorney, right? Mom or dad hire you to prepare an estate plan, which includes a revocable trust that becomes irrevocable after their passing. And then an individual is named as a trustee. Maybe it's a son, maybe it's a daughter, maybe it's an in-law. And you provide them with a copy of the trust if they don't have it. And you might send them a little bit of a letter. Uh, and you might tell them that they have a duty to account, and it may or may not end there. 
and they may or may not hire you. Um, but we find it to be a best practice to spell out exactly what the trustees' duties are in a letter to them. And I think a lot of people would say that the best person or the person who's in the best position to advise an individual trustee of all the responsibilities, duties, and obligations is the lawyer who's giving them the trust or who's telling them they're in charge. We're going to talk about rights of Florida beneficiaries, the Florida Trust Code. We'll spend a little bit of time regarding the compensation for trustees and their attorneys. We'll talk about the Florida limitations notices. And then we'll talk about probably the most boring subject today is when you're defending a trustee, answering the complaint or the petition and raising affirmative defenses, right? Affirmative defenses are not the most interesting or sexiest thing, yet they're one of the most important things that the law provides in defense of a trustee. So at Pinkowski Hauser, we, we have a vigorous defense practice where we're called upon to assist a number of trustees who are, you know, the, the defendant in the lawsuit. We also have a very vigorous plaintiff practice where we assist uh, family members or beneficiaries, and sometimes that involves suing a trustee. And then we'll finally conclude um, after we talk about answers and affirmative defenses, because the affirmative defenses, along with the Florida limitations notices, are really a trustee's best friend. And sometimes affirmative defenses are, are overlooked by certain lawyers in trust litigation matters. Um, I find that particularly to be the case when you have non-litigators who answer a complaint on behalf of a trustee and, and they're not raising the affirmative defenses. So with that said, let's begin and, and we'll ask ourselves why we're here and I'll give you 56 trillion reasons why we're here. The Boston College Center of Wealth and Philanthropy states that the greatest and most massive shift of wealth in the history of humankind is occurring right now. We're in the middle of it. $56 trillion is being transferred from one generation to future generations. And it's causing a lot of probate wars, right? And so you see a copy of, of my unpublished book, which is a group of short stories um, on this $59 trillion inheritance fight. Um, and it seems everyone's getting a lawyer. Everyone's more apt to question someone's fees or question attorneys or question trustees. And so we're gonna present, or I'm gonna to present to you today, some of the issues which I see and which members in our firm see as litigators. Issues that we come across constantly and consistently in our trust and estate litigation practice in downtown West Palm Beach. We're gonna to try to provide some, some decent practices or some best or better practices for you in your practice. And hopefully you won't need an appellate attorney or you won't need a litigator in your practice. Uh, and you can see a, a photo of my law partner, Rob Hauser, who is arguing in front of the Florida Supreme Court in that photo. So um, hopefully your, your estate planning practice or your um, probate practice is strong and healthy and you're assisting trustees and you're helping your practice grow, and you're, you're cautious about duties and responsibilities. Um, but if you don't, feel free, if you aren't, feel free to give us a call. We, we actually represent a number of, of attorneys uh, at our firm. So let's talk about revocable trusts for just a moment. Um, rev trusts seem to be a basic part of a client's estate plan, right? Absolutely meat and potatoes, right? Will, horrible will, rev trust, power of attorney, probably a durable power of attorney, healthcare documents that appoint a guardian or appoint a decision maker, a proxy, in case somebody is incapable of making those decisions on their own. So the Rev Trust increasingly is the main dispositive vehicle of someone's estate plan. The will pours over into the Rev Trust. So what are some of the worst aspects of a revocable trust? Well, in, in, from our perspective as litigators at Pankowski Hauser, um, when you create a trust that goes on after the creator's death, after the grantor's death or the settler's death, you're creating a financial stew. 
and, and, and you're mixing the financial lives of people who maybe don't get along, right? And the, the easiest example of that, I think, is the marital trust. When you have a second or third spouse who's the surviving spouse, who's a co-trustee, trustee, beneficiary of a marital trust, and the remainder bennies are the children from the first marriage, the children of the deceased grantor or set law, right? That's one of the worst aspects of a trust, because now you have people who can't stand each other, a second or third surviving spouse, and children from a prior relationship, right? Um, and their financial lives are connected. Another bad aspect about trust seems to be, well, you got to deal with your trustee, right? Many beneficiaries don't like that. They view their inheritance as their family money, as theirs. And how dare a trustee ask me for a budget or my income tax returns or my sources of income? And the trust beneficiary often thinks, you know, why do I have to ask this stranger or this person or Maybe it's my stepmom, maybe it's my dad's third spouse, or maybe it's my mom's fourth husband. Why do I have to ask them for money? And then oftentimes, um, you just have individuals behaving badly, right? And, and that is in many ways a strong focus of my book, Pankowski's Trustees Guide, 10 Steps to Family Trustee Excellent, where, where I, I look at a number of trustees behaving badly, treating trust property as their own, using the trust account as their personal ATM. Uh, individuals who don't know a blessed thing about prudent investing or managing a portfolio, let, let alone administering a trust. People who have neither the time nor experience to be a good fiduciary. Yet again, on the other side of that legal coin, there's some excellent aspects about trusts, right? Um, the first one is probably that you're dead. You don't have to deal with this stuff, right? I mean, generally speaking, uh, your REV trust is going to be administered for your benefit during your life, and you're typically the sole trustee of that REV trust during your life. And when you become incapacitated, uh, your successor trustee steps in, and when you're dead, uh, you don't have anything to worry about. Uh, and so wealth can be passed along, and generational wealth can be created from one generation to the next in this vehicle called the trust and it gives an opportunity to provide some fiscal discipline and saving for a rainy day right you can put money aside not to be touched until your grandkids or great grandkids go to college or grad school right um, and by the same token you can set money aside not to be touched until your children marry or have a child or buy a house so in some regards the trust is easy right you draft the document, pay a lawyer a few bucks, you name a trustee, and you should have a nice, tidy sum set away, distributed, not distributed, according to standards which you predetermine for the benefit of loved ones and chosen beneficiaries. Those are some of the best aspects of trusts. But why is trust litigation on the rise? Why is that happening? Why are lawsuits just on the increase, right? If you ask any Palm Beach County Circuit Court judge, including those in the probate division, they will tell you that they have, at any time, 1,600 to 1,800 cases. <clears throat> and in, at least in Palm Beach County, the probate division is the, has the exclusive jurisdiction over trust disputes. So if somebody files a trust action in the civil division, that's going to be, or it should be transferred to the probate division. There was a case in Palm Beach County about eight years ago where we, we, we have an administrative order that, that says that. You file a trust action, goes to the probate division. And, it, and there was a trust action that was filed. It was not transferred to the probate division. And then I guess somebody woke up and filed a motion to transfer in the civil division. And, and the judge denied it and said, you, you kind of waive that right. And that was never appealed, um, whether, whether you can actually waive that administrative order. But it's kind of interesting because there's a fourth district court of appeals case involving a trust, where at the trial level, they were applying Florida law. And that seemed to be an error because the trust document said that the trust was governed by New York law. 
And they raised that issue on appeal for the very first time. And the appellate court said, nope, we're, we're, we're not going to send it back down to the trial court because you applied the wrong law. You guys all applied Florida law and you waive this right to apply New York law. I don't think that's correct. I don't think you can waive the plain language of the document without some type of a finding. Uh, I don't think you can waive the governing law. I think it was error for the trial court, indeed all the lawyers, to apply the wrong law. Let's jump in and spend a little bit of time with an overview of duties of Florida trustees. And if you look in our Florida trust code, don't be intimidated or frustrated. Uh, you'll see that there's a number of duties and there's a number of statutes. There's a number of laws that deal with obligations of a Florida trustee. So you have a duty to administer a trust prudently. There's this duty of loyalty, which seems to be misunderstood or not understood at all. You have a duty of impartiality, prudent administration. You have duties regarding expenses and costs of administration, as well as your skill set, your trustee's skill set. There's issues regarding delegation, powers to direct, your duty to control and protect the trust property, to segregate and keep accurate records and to identify properly the trust property. And you also have other duties in the law, as you can see on the slide in front of you, right? And probably two of those that are the most important are in the right-hand column. And that is the duty to inform into account and to provide trust accountings, 736.0813 and 736.08135, right? I mean, those seem to be widely misunderstood, repeatedly misunderstood by individuals serving in the role of a trustee. And the most common example of that, I think, is when a trustee refuses to provide basic relevant information about the sale of real property that was a trust asset. When the beneficiary says, hey, you disclosed to me that you sold the beach house please send me the HUD-1, and the trustee says, no, I'm not going to send you the HUD-1. Or the beneficiary says, um, hey, I'd like some backup, and I'd like to independently verify certain costs and expenses associated with your tenure. Could you please email those documents, those invoices, those canceled checks to me? And the trustee says, no, but I'll make them available here at my office for you to review them, except that the beneficiary lives 3,000 miles away, right? A couple of serious breaches of duty by a trustee to a beneficiary. What is the duty of loyalty? The duty of loyalty means that a trustee is supposed to place his or her beneficiary's interests above everyone else's, including the trustee's own. And that's often just not understood, right? When a trustee accepts the position, accepts that mantle of responsibility, he or she is not only agreeing to serve as trustee, they're consenting to placing the interests of their beneficiaries above everyone else's, including their own. And it's widely misunderstood. Right? The duty of loyalty is so important because we're giving valuable property to this third party, a trustee, to administer it, not only according to the law, but according to the trust document. That means you need to actually read the trust document and you need to understand it. And if you don't understand the trust document, you need to hire somebody who can explain it to you, like a good trust lawyer in Florida. And you can pay that Florida trust lawyer from the trust money, from the trust assets but it's gotta be reasonable and it can't be crazy. Don't hire your brother-in-law, don't hire a lawyer who doesn't know a blessed thing about trust, let alone how to spell the word, right? Don't hire some non-lawyer or some lawyer who, doesn't, who isn't admitted in Florida and doesn't know anything about Florida trust law. But you do have a duty of loyalty that you owe that you agreed to provide to your beneficiaries and you have to place their interest above everyone else. 
Impartiality, right? Florida Trust Code 736.0803. You have to be impartial, right? Where a duty of loyalty typically runs from the trustee to the beneficiaries, there's some impartiality that's required by the trustee among or between beneficiaries, right? And, and this can get tricky sometimes because many times you'll have a discretionary trust that grants the trustee authority to distribute or not distribute income or principal to or among for the benefit of multiple beneficiaries. And so you can't be partial, right? You can't necessarily favor one over the other, but you have to understand that equitable is not always equal. Equal is not always correct, not always fair. So you have to treat the beneficiaries the same in the sense that you apply the law in the same way, you interpret the trust document in the same way, and you weigh all of their requests for money and all of their concerns. The end result may mean that in the exercise of your discretion, one trust, one trust beneficiary gets more and gets less than the other. That's not necessarily impartial if it was based on sound, prudent administration and discretion. So one of the, um, and, and re remember, equal isn't always equitable and proper, right? It's not always prudent. And probably the most common example of that is the passive trustee, uh, where you have, let's say, four beneficiaries of a trust. And one beneficiary is always asking for money, right? And, um, the trustee gets a request from one beneficiary who's always asking for money and says to the other beneficiaries, hey, your, your brother or your sister or your cousin um, asked for some money. What do you guys want me to do? And there's a little back and forth. And then the trustee says, well, I've spoken to all of you and you've agreed amongst yourselves that if everybody gets an equal amount, if all the trust beneficiaries get an equal amount, that's fine with everybody. And that's kind of poor discretion, right? A trustee has a duty to exercise his or her discretion themselves. You can't delegate your discretion. And in our little example, that's exactly what the trustee did. And equal isn't always proper, right? Uh, and it, it isn't always prudent. In, in, in our little example, uh, what may be more apropos is if you've got four beneficiaries, is to divide the trust into four shares, one for each beneficiary or their family, if upon the death of one of those beneficiaries, their family issue or descendants inherit. And if you've got one beneficiary who's constantly asking you for money, Take the money out of his or her share. That may be one solution around trying to be impartial to everybody and yet being loyal to all your beneficiaries. Let's talk next about the duty to inform and account, two of the most important duties that a trustee has of a Florida trust. Right, and so if you look at that, 736.0813. You'll see that within 60 days after acceptance of the trust, right, or when you learn that a trust is now irrevocable, the trustee has to give notice. Who do you give notice to? You give notice to the Bennies. And what do you tell them? You tell them who you are, what your name is, what your address is. And if you've got a lawyer, you need to tell them that the fiduciary lawyer client privilege, right, the attorney client privilege for a trustee and his or her lawyer applies. Right. And what that is, is that's an attempt to clearly state the law that if a trustee hires a lawyer, the lawyer's communications, thoughts and impressions and those of the trustee client belong to them, belongs to the trustee client and beneficiaries should not be able to get that. You also have to give them a complete copy of the trust agreement, including any amendments. And you have to provide annual accountings. What's more so in paragraph E is in Edgar, right? What I think one of the most important things to notice is that there's a duty to provide relevant information. 
And some individual trustees just don't seem to get that. I mean, they really don't seem to get that. Relevant information is pretty darn broad. And we often see the case where you'll have beneficiaries, right? If you look at the extremes, you'll have some beneficiaries who are just a pain, right? They hate their trustee. They hate the fact that their inheritance is in a trust. And they're constantly barraging the trustee with requests for information and multiple emails a day, asking for information and posing questions. And they're really a pain. And on the other end, you can look at the other end of the spectrum and you probably have dealt with a trustee who's similar, but on the other end of that spectrum, the trustee who is absolutely mean, doesn't like being trustee, doesn't like the beneficiary, doesn't like anything about the trust. And so the trustee says, no, 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 or is non-responsive to the trust beneficiary. Right? Neither of those are good. But the truth is, if a trustee is being harassed or barraged by multiple emails a day and inquiries from a trust beneficiary, the very simple solution for the trustee, resign. That's what you do. If you don't like being a trustee, you resign and you turn over the books and records to a successor trustee. You look for a successor trustee. And if you can't find a successor trustee, you go to the court and the woman or the man in the black robe in the, in the middle, high against the wall on the podium, they will appoint one. What the trustee should not do is ignore the trust beneficiary, right? A trustee is not required with immediacy in knee jerk reaction format to respond to each and every single inquiry that a beneficiary has. A trustee is, however, required to respond to reasonable inquiries within a reasonable time frame. What does that mean? Well, perhaps not that second, perhaps not that day, or certainly over a day or so, right? Um, and there certainly could be circumstances where a trustee can't get back to a beneficiary within a week. That's possible. But a trustee does need to be responsive. Why is that? Because when the trustee accepted the mantle of responsibility, he or she agreed to place the interests of that beneficiary above everyone else's, including the trustee bill. And the trustee owes a duty of loyalty, which includes being responsive and includes providing relevant information and includes answering questions from a trust beneficiary. Now, a couple of issues, a couple of cases um, that we, we, we mentioned and that we look back on repeatedly. You know, this webinar is the CLE for Florida trust lawyers or Florida attorneys who advise trustees is long on commentary, long on statutory law and short, short on case law. But here's two that you should look at. Look at the Cassidy case, C-A-S-S-E-D-Y versus versus Alland Investments Corporation, A-L-L-A-N-D. The site is 128 Southern 3rd, 976. It's a 2014 Florida First District Court of Appeal trust case that distinguishes between an action for an accounting, the right to the accounting, the burden to prove how the money was handled or not handled, versus an action for breach of fiduciary duty, right? And so sometimes you see causes of action or complaints that say, I'm suing for my right to an accounting trustee and I'm suing for breach of trust. The failure to account is a breach of trust. But that's probably consumed within the cause of action of to compel an accounting. But what the Cassidy case says is, look, take baby steps. If if you're if you're you shouldn't be alleging that there's stuff wrong in the accounting until you've seen it. So file a, a, a an action for breach of fiduciary duty or to compel an accounting. Get the accounting, then look at it, analyze it, and then tell me if there's any maladministration or anything that's been wrong. That's the Cassidy case, and it lists the elements of a cause of action for breach of fiduciary duty, what the trust code calls breach of trust, right? The elements are the existence of a duty, the breach of that duty and damages flowing from that breach.
The other case you want to look at is the Hilgendorf case. The Hilgendorf case is a uh, fourth district case from Florida's fourth district court of appeal issued October 26, 2016. 201 Southern 3rd, 1262, Hilgendorf. This is a really, really interesting case. And the question that's posed by the Hilgendorf case is whether or not you can, after the death of the set law of a Florida trust, obtain accountings for that trust for the period of time of the settler's life. And Hilgendorf says, to get that, to get an accounting of the deceased, the decedent's trust, the settlor's trust, for a period of time prior to the settler's death, you need to allege either some breach of fiduciary duty by the trustee, or some allegation that the terms of the trust were not complied with. And in the Hilgendorf case, the settlor or the creator actually stepped down as trustee and had somebody else serve as trustee during, I guess, the last few years of the life of the settlor. And so somebody who didn't get along with that trustee after the settlor died sued for an accounting. And the Hilgendorf case talks all about the right to a trust accounting and discusses when you can get or receive an accounting pre-death for the period of time prior to the death of the settler. Pre-death accountings, Florida trusts, Hilgendorf. Let's talk about rights of Florida beneficiaries for a few minutes. Why, if this is advising a trustee, why are we talking about trust beneficiary rights? Because your trustee needs to know all about them so that when a beneficiary requests something, they know how to respond. And so that a trustee has an understanding of what his or her obligations are. There is a right to have the trustee administer the trust in good faith. So if you're biased, um, if you can't put those biases aside, you shouldn't be serving as trustee. Right? If you're trustee of your stepson or stepdaughter, you can't stand them. Well, are you really going to act in good faith? Are you really going to put their best interests? Or is your hatred or your um, disdain for your stepson or stepdaughter going to affect your administration? You probably shouldn't be trustee. A beneficiary has a right to have your trustee administer the trust according to the trust document in Florida law. This may seem silly. This may seem Amazingly obvious, it's not. I recall one trustee who said, well, I'm, I'm gonna give my daughter X dollars from the trust. And I said, well, why in the world would you do that? Well, she's my daughter, I love her. The only problem was the trust document didn't permit distributions to the daughter. Permitted distributions to the daughter's aunts. Permitted distributions to the trustees, sisters, you've got to follow the trust document. You need to understand it. You need to read it and reread it. And let's face it, individuals serving as trustee, they don't understand the whole discretion thing. They don't understand the whole request, it's the request for principle and the exercise of discretion by a fiduciary. They don't know how they're supposed to act under those circumstances. Trust beneficiaries have the right to have your trustee administer the trust solely for the interests of the beneficiaries. Beneficiaries have a right to have your trustee avoid acts of self-dealing and conflicts of interest, right? 736-0802, super important. Conflicts need to be avoided at all costs. Acts of self-dealing are not permitted, no matter how good you think the deal is, right? If there's a piece of real estate to be sold and your wife or your husband is a, a, a broker, don't give that to him or her. If the trust money needs to be invested in your son-in-law or daughter-in-law or works for a broker, don't give him or her that trust account. If 
um, there's a piece of real property for sale in the trust and you buy it as trustee, that's an act of self-dealing. Don't do it. Resign and then deal with it at arm's length. Avoid conflicts, avoid self-dealing. A beneficiary has a right to have the trustee invest trust assets in a prudent manner, right? 518.11, that's Florida's prudent investor rule. The truth is, is most individuals serving as a trustee have neither the time nor the experience to manage and invest trust assets. They don't understand portfolio management. They really shouldn't be managing money. They should delegate, right? They should hire somebody to manage and administer the trust assets. According to 518.11, Florida's prudent investor rule, Florida law 518.11, they need a formal strategy or plan for the investment, retention, sale, and purchase of assets. One of the worst sins that a trustee can commit is to just buy something and not review it and just hold without reviewing it and monitoring it the duty to monitor right that's ostrich investing a fiduciary the trustee has an ongoing duty to monitor his or her investments another sin that individual trustees often commit is they inherit a portfolio and they do no independent analysis. They don't talk to the beneficiaries. They don't look at their needs, their wants. They don't read the trust document. They just keep whatever they inherited in the investment portfolio from the prior trustee, right? And their excuses as well, you know, the settlor invested this in all bonds and I assume she knew what she was doing and she liked, so I just kept it. That's a roadmap to being a defendant in a lawsuit. That's not an investment strategy and it's certainly not prudent. If you analyze the investment portfolio based on 518.11, based upon being a prudent trustee, you may come to the same conclusion, but you have to conduct that analysis. You have a right to have your trustee act impartially. You have a right to have your trustee administer the trust prudently. You have a right to have the trustee use any special skills which the trustee has. So that means folks like us, attorneys or accountants or people who work for financial concerns, we have a little higher duty, right? We're supposed to use those skills if we have them. You have a right as a trust beneficiary in Florida to have your trustee monitor and limit expenses of the trust and they need to be reasonable. A trust beneficiary in Florida has the right to have the trustee control and protect the trust property. Right? A trustee just can't throw up his hands. A trustee needs to take reasonable steps to protect trust property. Right, Secure investable assets. Margin, not a good idea. Gambling, not a good idea. Stock concentrations, not a good idea. Real estate, is it insured? Is it safeguarded? Is it free of hazards? And then remember, you're supposed to segregate, keep separate all the trust property. The trust property is supposed to be in the name of the trust. John Jeffrey Pinkowski, comma, trustee of the John Jeffrey Pinkowski Revocable Trust. That's how you hold title to property. That's somebody else's trust property. If the trust has a claim or lawsuit against someone, it's your trustee's job to enforce that claim or lawsuit. What becomes challenging for some trustees is investigating the acts of the prior trustee. Does a trustee have a duty to investigate the prior acts or the acts of a prior trustee? And what if you discover that the prior trustee, prior trustee did some very bad things? like took too much compensation or paid their accountants too much or engaged in conflicted transactions or acts of self-dealing or lost a lot, a lot of money because they didn't invest prudently. Call your trust litigation attorney because it sounds like you 
successor trustee have some rights to exercise. When one trustee leaves and another one takes over, you're supposed to transfer all the books and records and that should be done timely. You know, it's funny, um, at our law firm, we do so much discovery in these trust and estate lawsuits. And my, how the world of discovery has changed, right? It used to be, well, you know, I need a week to gather the documents and uh, you're gonna have to come in and get them printed and, and, and blah, blah, blah. And now it's like, just send me a PDF, send me documents. They're scanned, they should be scanned. Send me a Dropbox or God forbid, send me a disc. Some people are still using discs. So you have the right to relevant information about the trust. We talked a little bit about that. You have a right to have annual trust accountings, right? Uh, annual trust accountings, showing all gains, losses, trustees, fees, and distributions. Now, the, the issue comes up in trust litigation as to what constitutes an accounting. And if you're going to have an accounting, don't just send statements. Send something that says trust accounting and have different schedules and have the Florida Trust Code 736.0813 and 736.08135 elements, right? Have those features on your trust accounting. Many individual trustees make the mistake of sending statements to their trust beneficiaries. Statements are not accountings. Now they may, in some circumstances, have all or nearly all of the information that a trust accounting is required to disclose. So I think the best practice for trustees is to send monthly statements with a limitations notice to each of your trust beneficiaries. Send a year-end statement with a limitations notice to your trust beneficiaries. And complete an annual accounting. You can ask your beneficiaries if they want to waive their annual accounting and forego the cost that you're going to have to pay an accountant to prepare annual accounting. And if they waive that in writing, there's a good reason to save the trust some money and you can be relieved of providing that annual accounting for that year. You can't hide the ball as a trustee. You can't operate the trust in private. I can't tell you how many prospective clients call our law firm in West Palm Beach and say, I want to sue my trustee. And I say, send me a copy of the trust document. And I say, I don't have it. The trustee won't give it to me, and they won't tell me about the trust or the assets. Trustees cannot operate a trust in private. You have a duty of disclosure. You can't hide the ball. Let's talk about the Florida Trust Code a little bit, and we will start to begin to wind up today's Florida Bar approved continuing legal education course. The Florida Trust Code. You begin with 736.0201, that's your keys uh, to the courthouse, that's your doorway, right? If you look at 0201, it talks about the role of the court in trust matters, and it tells you everything that you can do, right? First of all, it tells you that you have to file a civil action, right? Uh, and it tells you that a court has the authority to intervene in the administration of a trust, right? Uh, as long as somebody's interested in the trust who files the lawsuit, right? We can't have a stranger do it. But a, a, a judicial proceeding involving a trust can be very, very broad. It can review trustees' fees. It can appoint or remove a trustee. It can determine the validity of a part of a, part of a trust or all of a trust. It can uh, uh, give you a declaration of rights. It can determine, quote, any other matters, close quote, involving trustees and beneficiaries, right? So a, a circuit court in the state of Florida can do just about anything regarding a trust. So where do I sue a beneficiary? Or where do I where do I get sued? Right? That is a common question. Why? Well, here in Florida, um, your clients that you drafted or prepared a trust for may have lived here, right? They may have lived in Boca Raton or Tequesta or Martin County or Orlando or Tampa. 
but their beneficiaries might live elsewhere. In fact, when they die, their successor trustee may live elsewhere. So you have to be careful, right? Because venue is different than personal jurisdiction. And many times people get confused of where you're supposed to sue a trustee or where a trustee can sue someone. So Florida's trust code's venue statute is 736-0204. If you have a question about venue, where to sue somebody regarding a Florida trust, look at 736-0204, right? That's the venue statute. Uh, and it tells you where venue lies, where the proper place is to sue somebody regarding a trust. And, and, and in that it says, um, look, venue's proper anywhere under chapter 47 of the Florida laws. Any county where the beneficiary suing or being sued resides or has its principal place of business or the county where the trust has its principal place of administration. Principal place of administration. You want to take a look at that at 0108, right? Florida Trust Code 736.0108. Principal place of administration. The principal place of administration is generally where the trustee's business is located or where the books and records are kept. Right, so take a look at 736.0108. Right, you need some sufficient connection with the designated jurisdiction. Right, and that section talks all about what we view as principal place of administration. Now, what gets more interesting is when you have multiple trustees. Where's the principal place of administration if you've got three co-trustees? One thing you shouldn't do is confuse personal jurisdiction with venue. Where you sue a trustee is a different issue than whether you can sue a trustee, right? So under 736.0202, that's the personal jurisdiction, right? That has to do with personal jurisdiction, can you drag somebody into a Florida courtroom who's a beneficiary or a trustee or something? Very, very important. When can I sue? Well, if you look at 736.0207, we're talking about rev trusts. If you're gonna contest the validity or revocation of all or a part of the trust, you're not supposed to do it until the trust becomes irrevocable by its terms or the seller's death. And this gets a little confusing. Right. Everybody knows that when the settler passes, OK, fine, you can file a trust contest in Florida. But what happens if the settlor is incapacitated? Doesn't then the trust become irrevocable by its terms? Right. If that settlor was the only person to retain the right to amend or revoke and he or she is now incapacitated, incapable of exercising the right to amend or revoke, doesn't that become irrevocable? And can't you sue to contest the validity or revocation of all or a part of a trust at that point? The Florida Trust Code. Chapter 736. What do you mean they can change my trust after I'm gone? This freaks a lot of clients out, right? When you talk to them about reformation or modification, most people don't understand that. And I think that's because most trust attorneys, estate planning lawyers who prepare or write wills and trusts, don't explain this to them. And there may not be a reason to, but the truth is, is after you're gone, after you're dead, your will or your trust can be changed. And in our context, we're talking about trust today, to reform a mistake in a trust, look at 736.0415. And if you want to modify a trust, if you want to change its terms, look at 736.0413 and 736.0415 of the Florida Trust Code. Yes, you can change the terms of a trust. Yes, even when it says it's not, quote, amendable, close quote. <laughs> even when it says it's irrevocable and unalterable. You can reform it to correct a mistake. 
you can change its terms, maybe even who the trustee is under certain modification circumstances, such as if circumstances were not anticipated by the set law, the grantor of the trust, the person who created the trust, or if it's in the best interests of the beneficiaries. The beneficiaries need to be cautious. Just because your trustee won't give you as much money as you'd like, doesn't mean it's in your best interest to remove that trustee. Compensation of trustees, you can find that at 736.0708, everybody knows it's reasonable. Most um, probate court judges will look at the number of hours that you spend administering the trust or a percentage of all the assets under management, and you can goose that up or goose that down depending on potential liability and requirements and um, complexities of the job. Compensation for the trustee's attorneys, take a look at 736.1007. Be mindful there's a strong distinction between a revocable trust that becomes irrevocable upon the death of the grantor or the settler of the trust, the creator of the trust, when it is going to work hand in glove with administering the estate of the deceit, different than I have a plain old irrevocable trust and I need a trust attorney to assist me with it. The trustee's best friend, Florida's limitations notice, 736.1008. God, you've got to read that. Every document that a trustee sends to a beneficiary should have some disclosure and have a limitations notice. If you don't know what a limitations notice is, you can read the statute. It'll tell you all about it. It'll tell you what language to use. Don't bury it. We typically have a cover letter that says this contains a limitations notice under 736.1008. You may wish to consult an attorney. By the way, I'm enclosing a copy of the pertinent statutes that you may want to read. Otherwise, you're going to need trial and appellate counsel. Defending a trustee in a trust litigation, answers and affirmative defenses. This is, I promise, is probably the most boring part, so we'll go through this very quickly. The takeaway from this, or the perspective from this, is the following. There are a lot of affirmative defenses that your trustee can exert when he or she is being sued, and you need to understand them. You need to look at the plaintiff's case, what their quantum of damages is, how they get there, whether there are any alternative damage scenarios, where the damage was actually pled, and how they're going to prove it, and whether damages were really incurred. There are a number of affirmative defenses that are built into the Florida Trust Code beyond those that are mentioned in the Florida Rules of Civil Procedure. A couple of them that are very important are when a beneficiary consents or releases you from something, or if there's liability that was incurred by a third party, or contribution from a co-trustee. In the investment context, you should think about in delegating your investment authority to an investment agent. And even though the Florida Trust Code uses the word agent, that person is actually a fiduciary subject to the jurisdiction of Florida courts. So in conclusion, all of us seem to be mired in these trust wars or these probate wars. There are many great aspects about revocable trusts and others which are more complicated and less attractive. There are a number of duties that Florida trustees are required to agree they agree to provide to their beneficiaries. And if trust litigation does ensue, there's a number of ways to defend your trustee through answers, affirmative defenses, and analysis of breaches and damages. The course number for this Florida Bar approved CLE is 1701689N as in Nancy. The course name is the Florida Lawyer's Guide to Advising the Trustee. You will receive one hour of general CLE credits. If my law partner, Robert Hauser, or I can ever assist you with any appellate, trial, dispute, or other issues regarding wills, trust estates, or guardianships, it'd be a pleasure to speak with you as long as we have no conflicts, confidentially, and free of charge. 
My name is John Pinkowski. I'm an estate and trust litigation attorney with Pinkowski Hauser in West Palm Beach, Florida. Thank you for listening. And this concludes our seminar on a Florida Lawyer's Guide to Advising the Trustee.